Hi everyone, it's MJ, and a couple of days ago, I recorded a podcast with Fazan Asani. Now, he has created Vela, which is a cryptocurrency exchange based here in South Africa. And I sat down with him to discuss risk management and all things around operating these new cryptocurrency exchanges. Now, originally, I was going to release this podcast in a series of nine videos, but I've decided to change my mind and I'm gonna release them all now at once. Now, if you have seen the first two parts, don't worry, I am gonna put timestamps for each of the various questions and topics that we discussed, so feel free to just skip the first two if you've already seen them. Otherwise, you can click on one that you wanna see. For instance, my favorite is when I ask him, you know, what role can actuaries play in cryptocurrency exchanges? But anyway, let's head to the podcast. Cheers. Are you recording? So yeah, so I've got the recording um, on Skype and I always do a double take with my phone. So I've got the phone recording here and I'm doing the recording on Skype. So hopefully both okay. don't fail. <laughs> okay, perfect. So no, yeah, um, first off, yeah, welcome. Welcome and thank you for, for agreeing to do this podcast with me. Um, like, I, like I said, there will be a description in the video below about your podcast that you did with Gray, where you spoke about your financial philosophy and your career journey so far. And I must say, I really, really enjoyed it. So I'm going to yeah, put that link in the description and all the people who are watching this, can, uh, yeah, I recommend that you go check it out. But with you, I want to jump straight into it and I want to come and hit with a nice meaty question because I know there's a lot of uh, entrepreneurs potentially watching this video. And I did read in one of the reports that you guys raised $1.5 million for a startup, which is pretty amazing. And I guess you know, the first question is, you know, how, how did you do it? Did you have an amazing business plan? Was it because of your network? Or what was the secret sauce to raise so much money for, for a startup? Great. So first of all, thanks for having me on the, on the podcast. It's great to be here and um, to dive right into that question. Uh, I think it's a combination of things that you just referred to. So we, we raised $1.55 million uh, in total from two primary investors. One was Michael Yordan. So your name, but with two A's at the end. <laughs> and um, he, for those that don't know, he is the uh, former CEO of FNB, First National Bank, here in South Africa, part of the First Rank Group. And he, re he really did a fantastic job uh, with FNB, making it actually uh, one of the most, uh, they got an award for, for being the most innovative bank in the world under his tenure. So um, he was one of them. And then the second uh, investor was Bitrex, Mm -hmm. cryptocurrency exchange and I, and I think um, you know with Michael I had known him from before starting Valor and uh, we had a couple of conversations and um, we had like a 10 page pitch deck which kind of outlined what we were trying to do and um, and you know he I think based on our relationship he he decided to invest and, and that wasn't a very lengthy process because we had known each other from uh, before, but that's quite different to the investment from Bitrex where we had never ever met them. They didn't know us. We had never met them. There, there was no relationship beforehand. And actually we just reached out to them and said, listen, we hear you're having partnerships with other cryptocurrency exchanges around the world. Uh, are you interested in chatting to us and seeing if we can get into a partnership? And um, that was my co-founder that initiated that discussion. And um, effectively, long story short, uh, you know, tens of uh, conversations and the business plan and not just the package check, but actually an in-depth written business plan Later, after that, we I got onto the plane and actually went to Chicago, and we had a one-hour breakfast meeting in a hotel in Chicago, and uh, sealed the deal then. So really, we've only spent one hour in person with our our, our major investor, which is Bitrex. Um, but I think that did a lot of the their own due diligence on us. So. So really two very different processes for, for our two main investors, but um, we were very lucky, as you said, to raise well, just over one and a half million dollars for an idea that we had. 
and um, yeah, we're you know, hopefully we've done some good things with that money, so we can come back to that in in in, in some of the future questions. No, yeah, good. congratulations. I mean, that is that is an achievement in itself. And I mean, com- coming because you say you've got these two different investors. I mean, for for the entrepreneurs out there, what would you say? your general investor looks for in an entrepreneur? You know, is it passion? Is it experience? Is it qualification? Is it having that relationship? You know, what, what, are, what are some of the things that unite an entrepreneur to an investor in a business uh, environment? I mean, I think ultimately it comes down to having faith in the capacity of an individual who's leading a business to actually make it work. Um, that could come down to experience. It could come down to just grit or integrity. Or there's a there's a whole bunch of things I think characteristics that investors are looking for. But ultimately, it comes down to belief in the individual. Can they do what they say that they're going to do? And do you believe that they're actually going to be able? And whether it's through their own experience or their ability to. Um, there are, you know, uh, there are many reasons and ways that can happen, but I think it does that come down to that belief. And I think, especially with my some of my conversations with the investors, you know, uh, oftentimes they didn't spend too much time on the legal framework. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and uh, we've actually secured another investor now that isn't public information. I can't say too much about the investor. But um, the, we've, so we've just raised a little bit more money as well, which you, you're, the, you're the first person actually that we're turning this to. Perfect. <laughs> um, yeah, so part of the press. But unfortunately, uh, we, we, it's not public information, the, 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 uh, you know, who the investor is, but uh, you know, in the future, maybe we, we will dis- disclose that. But based, based on these discussions, um, it's been interesting to me to see how you know, seasoned investors will say, listen, you have the legals in place. You have to have the legals in place, but that's basically really as a backstop if things go really wrong and just to make sure people understand what the terms are of the investment. But ultimately, uh, it really comes down to, do I believe in this individual? If yes, let's do it. If no, let's go and find somebody else I believe in. Okay. It's, I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting because, you know, from, from our actuarial backgrounds, you know, we've always been taught to, you know, look at risk, and if the return for the amount of risk you're taking on is you know acceptable, then then it's a green light. But of course, that's very much a an academic or theoretical um, way of doing things. It's it's interesting hearing how people you know come fall back to belief, and I guess there's a little bit of gut feeling as well. You know, which you know is this person able to do what they are able to do? It's it's a bit of a subjective, especially when let's say you're only having a one hour breakfast with these people. You know they need to make those those calls. So it's it's interesting hearing about that. Um, but coming coming to risk, this is this is something that I always find interesting with with regards to to startups and just risk in general. I know there's there's many different ways of seeing risk. So first off, I want to ask you what what is your definition of risk, and what would you say are the top two risks every new startup faces, irrespective of industry and size. So great question. So let me just make a comment on your on your previous comment, which is just you know actuaries kind of looking at risk and, and having a robust model, etc. And um, you know you know the the fact of the matter is with a startup, odds are against your success. So if you were going to be looking at the you, you know the models about investing, nobody would ever invest in a startup because uh, the chances of survival are slim. Mm-hmm. So it, I think it really does come down to much more than just the models, which is actually uh, the belief, as I said beforehand. So uh, it's especially early stage, especially when you only have an idea. I mean, obviously with venture capital, you have a whole spectrum, uh, and it can come from seed investing, and angel investing, seed investing, first round, second round, etc., or uh, Series A, B, etc. And um, obviously, hopefully, the risk gets less and less as you go down that spectrum. But especially at the beginning, I don't think there would be any model that would spit out and invest, you know. And, and even with people that are seasoned investors or serial entrepreneurs, whenever you're getting into a new endeavor, there are so many different types of risks that uh, one doesn't even know about. 
uh, let, let alone the ones you know about and you're trying to quantify, which is always wrong. Mm -hmm. um, so, so yeah, so coming back to your question about, you said, what are the two major risks? Yes. Um, or, or how do I define risk and what are the two major risks of any startup? So I think, you know, there, there's so many different types of risk. Uh, and I think generally we're talking about financial risk here. Uh, and, and that would be, you know, someone that, what is the possibility probability I am going to not get my money back effectively? Mm -hmm. um, but then there's many other types of risk, reputational risk and, and uh, operational risk, market risk, tons of tons of different types of risks. So I think given the financial risk, which is really um, what is the probability of me not getting my money back? I think the two main risks of any startup is um, I, I say the first thing is like your product market fit. So there's a risk that whatever you're trying to put out there is actually not wanted by the market. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that could be because of timing or just the product itself isn't what people are looking for, etc. So that a product market fit, I think, is a very big risk. And then I would say probably the second biggest one is uh, executional. Okay. You know, and how. And then what is the risk of investing some money into a startup, into some entrepreneurs, and do they actually know how to execute this? Now, that could be just from making sure they're not fraudulent, so literally just stealing the money and going uh, elsewhere to the, they have a lot of integrity, but potentially they, they're you know, their operations and their relationships with with uh, individuals or broader team members aren't as good as they may be so that they just can't pull it off. So I, I would say probably those are two, the two main things, assuming obviously you, 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 you've you been able to secure some funding in the first place. I, I must say, I like that one about the, the product and, you know, not being a match for the market because... I think a lot of times um, entrepreneurs, and this is myself included when I've you know, dabbled in this in the past, is I come up with an idea, I think this idea is amazing, um, and I'm so arrogant with believing my idea is the best thing ever, that I go out and I build the entire thing, and then I take it to market, and I'm like, market, look at my amazing product, and people are like, ooh, um, we don't actually like this, or this is too confusing, or how does this actually work? And it's it's so important, I guess, to have that conversation uh, before building the product. Um, you know, going to people, doing that market research, saying, "Is this something you want?" Rather than building it and then finding out finding out later. So that's yeah, I I can definitely uh, relate to that one. And then of course, execution is is such a big one because especially in today's world with the internet i mean ideas are out there um there's so many different uh things to do there's so many innovations and ways to do things that it's not about having a great idea it's about executing the idea that um i think makes makes the difference um but this maybe then leads into well, can, I, can, I, can i can i can i just say one thing on yes. what you just mentioned yes go for it because you, you talked a little about you know seeing if there's product market fit and to kind of you know talk to people etc. If possible, I would I would suggest not doing that, but actually just putting a minimal viable product into the market, just getting something up and running so you can test people's actions, not their words. Because mm -hmm. oftentimes people say one thing, uh, but they actually do another. Mm -hmm. So as much as possible, if you can actually get some sort of you know, prototype out there just to test what people, how people interact with it or if they want it. I think that will probably be much more powerful than, than surveys, but obviously the first thing to do is, is talk to people and see if they would want it. Yes. I mean, you know, just like with, with my example, what I did, this was back when I was at university, um, we developed a collective buying um, online store where the idea was that all the prices were hidden and people would pay to reveal the price and by paying to reveal the price the price would then decrease with each reveal and then as soon as somebody purchased it at the discount it then reset it back uh, to the beginning but of course we we did this whole thing we built the whole website we got everything up and running 
And it was amazing because we, we failed basically in the two, two risks that you mentioned. The one thing was we found people just revealed and bought something straight away. So if they wanted the Man United t-shirt or they wanted the scanning uh, device that we were selling, they just bought it straight away. They didn't really matter too much about the, the cost. And it was mainly family members uh, who were doing this uh, that were our initial customers. And then what we also found is, so people yeah, weren't actually using it. We thought people would buy the drops and reveal the price and look, you know, be, be bargain hunters, which we didn't see that activity. And then two, we took a big smack with logistics on trying to deliver items. It was something that we, we had no experience at. I mean, we were nerds making websites. Now we had to try and deliver a Man United t-shirt, you know, get it from the supplier, get it to the customer, in as short a period as possible and then find out that the size wasn't the right one and have to handle returns and it was basically a yeah not not one of my my more successful ventures that i've done in in life um that's true and, and i think that's that's been one of the nice things about um actuarial science it has been this focus on you know managing risk compared to mm-hmm. when i was an entrepreneur which it was you know just take a leap of faith and and hope for the best um, which, like I said, this maybe links in very nicely to the next question, which is, in your opinion, how, how should startups deal with risk? I mean, should the risk-seeking entrepreneurs um, ignore them and be like me and take that leap of faith and just hope for the best? Or should they consider implementing like a strict risk management framework from the start, even though that might struggle or, or strangle a little bit of the innovation and the, the culture of the company? Like, how, how would you say, or, or what would you say is the best attitude to risk for, for a startup, uh, bearing in mind that the, the odds are stacked up against them? Yeah, I think you always need to kind of take calculated risks with uh, any startup that you're doing. Now, you can't disregard risks and just go all out. Um, I think you certainly need to consider them, but the the thing is, if you're going to look at every single risk and look at the downside of every single scenario, then you're just not going to get anything off the ground. You know, you've got to try things and you've got to, uh, you, you have to take risk by definition. Mm-hmm. Now, it is also very, very dependent on the particular type of business that you're actually trying to get off the ground. So at Valor, where we're dealing with people's money, we can't like get a, a quick MVP out to the market that has lots of bugs in it and hope it gets right. It goes right just to see if, if people like it or not. Because if we do have uh, bugs in it, then even if people ready, you know, getting reputational damage from the start because we weren't ready to have them on in the first place. So for us, for example, while a lot of people will say, you know, get that MVP out there, like I said a little bit earlier. We had to spend a lot of time before we took our product to the market, internally testing, getting cybersecurity firms and experts on board to pen test it internally, externally, um, before we felt comfortable taking the first rand of a customer fund onto the platform. Okay. So from that perspective, we needed to be very conservative. But um, uh, so, yeah, so I would just say like, you need to decide what you first of all you need to understand what your risks are. I mean, to the, to the best that you can, we never understand fully what all our risks are and then try to mitigate them. But knowing full well that you need to do make a calculation about which risks can you take at the moment when you're still young to be able to get off the ground while ensuring that you mitigating those, those really important risks that are crucial to your, to, to your business as well. And I mean, this is one of the things about risks is there's the risks that you know about that you can then manage. And then there's sometimes the risks that you don't know about that kind of pop up and, and surprise you. And I don't know if you, you, ha- you, know, you came across any of these, but, but if you did, you know, what, what were some of the risks that you wish you knew about before you started Vela? I think, uh, you know, ironically, being in the banking space, which which I was in for six years, I think we didn't really appreciate how difficult it would be to operate a bank as a cryptocurrency exchange, a bank account as a, as a cryptocurrency exchange. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, there were other players in the market that were, you know, operating and, 
and we didn't really think too much about that but we've had to spend a lot of the t- a lot of our time and our resources on um, on basically making the banks happy okay so um, now obviously we have lots of 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 uh, you know checks and balances that we have in place we have a very robust anti money laundering policy counter terrorism financing policy we do kyc for all our customers so you can't even get onto our our platform without that but um, the banks oftentimes require a lot of tlc let's put it that way mm-hmm. and um, and so we've had to spend a lot of time just actually taking them through our processes and, 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 you know, sometimes there will be instances where, you know, the banks won't see or they, they won't understand the activity that's taking place in, uh, you know, on your account. And especially as we've grown quite quickly over the past few months when we introduced fiat to, to Bitcoin trading, mm-hmm. you know, they'll, they'll call you in and they'll say, hey, what's going on here? Or they'll, they'll make it more difficult for you to transact. So we've had to spend a lot of time just kind of mitigating those risks because we have to have a bank account to to offer our product, which is a gateway between fiat currency, the RAND at the moment, and cryptocurrencies in general. So I think that's one area where we didn't quite uh, appreciate uh, um, the, the intense uh, kind of effort that would be needed to, to work with the banks. Okay. Because I mean, that's, that's something I even saw on your, your Twitter account is you said, hey guys, please be patient. You know, there's a bank there that is busy struggling or, or one of their systems down. So the withdrawal process is yeah. going to be, uh, be delayed. And, you know, I've got, got friends who work uh, for, for some of the other exchanges in, in South Africa. And, you know, I always like to ask them, oh, what, what are you guys doing? Are you expanding? You know, are you going to be opening up in other African uh, countries? And they say that you know one of the things that prohibits them or which makes it difficult for them to let's say start up in in nigeria is the banks they say the banks in in nigeria are not as sophisticated as the ones here and that they they even have yeah, a lot of a lot of problems just even sometimes connecting and communicating with them so it's yeah it's, it's interesting hearing hearing that and i mean i also like when i you know because i still try and play around with with fintech and, and entrepreneurial ideas and one thing I sometimes hear from the developers is they say the biggest thing that's going to cause us a time delay is connecting with the banks. They say that that, that is a, a difficult thing, which is it's in a weird way. It's, it's kind of um, how would you say? I mean, because in the one way, crypto is a potentially a substitute for banks. So the fact that the banks are the ones that are how you could say the Achilles heel, it's in, in, a, in a weird way, it's, it's, it should be a happy feeling because it's like, well, one day we might, you know, be able to compete with these guys if the sense that they, you know, they're, they're making, not mistakes, but if they're not able to, to handle this type of innovation. Um, especially, like I say, the, the banking systems uh, outside of South Africa, because, yeah, it's, uh, it's an interesting one. It really, really is an interesting one. And, and I mean, yeah. maybe, maybe coming, you know, more, more onto these crypto exchanges, um, you know, talking about the banking one, what would you say are some of the other unique risks that cryptocurrency exchanges uh, face? And if you don't mind, could you maybe share with us some of the, the risk management techniques that you deploy in order to deal with these risks? Yeah, sure. So um, I think there are many risks for, for, for a startup like ours. There are, there are many risks. One of the risks is, is just the security of the crypto assets that we hold. So as you know, in the cryptocurrency space, there have been many exchanges that have been hacked or have lost funds of their customers, etc. So, I mean, I remember uh, before we actually started Valor, uh, I remember thinking, uh, I was having a shower and I was thinking to myself, my goodness, you know, am I really going to get into this business where we're responsible for customer funds mm-hmm. in an industry where there have been so many hacks and so many kind of breaches, security breaches that have resulted in loss of customer funds. Mm-hmm. And it actually gave me quite a, a lot of anxiety. And I felt, gosh, I, this is really uncomfortable to think about that, that scenario playing out. Mm-hmm. And then I felt, and then I thought, well, you know, someone's got to do it and it's, you know, it's going to be happening. And, and, and if I were a customer, I would probably want my funds to be 
uh, at an exchange where the customer does feel nervous about losing my funds and gets anxiety about it and does something about it to keep them safe. So I thought, you know, given that and given, you know, life, and not just startups where you do need to take risks, I thought, okay, well, 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 let's just get into it and let's do the very best that we can do to secure customer funds. And so we've done a few things to, uh, to mitigate that risk, which is, first of all, we've got a very strong security team. We have uh, the, the, the head of our security team, he actually built the online banking security platforms for two of the largest banks in South Africa. So he's a very seasoned kind of security expert. Um, uh, so he, he's the one mitigating factor that we brought in place just to say, let's get the people that actually know what they're talking about in, in, in place. So mm-hmm. that in and of itself, the fact that he, he basically built the online uh, security systems of two of South Africa's largest banks. That's not enough in, of, in and of itself because we're dealing with a new industry. Mm-hmm. But the other great thing about this individual is that he was also in uh, cryptocurrency from very, very early on. So he was mining Bitcoin when it was sub $1. Oh, wow. Uh, and, and I remember him telling me that <laughs> you know, he, he, made a, he, he thought that he had, he had sold at the top when he sold at $6. <laughs> you know, so 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 he's had a lot of experience in the traditional uh, security industry. He's been in the cryptocurrency industry for from basically uh, the very very early days, um, and so so that's the one thing to get the right people in place. And then we've done a lot of, of, of research, talking to experts in the field, speaking with cybersecurity firms and to cryptocurrency experts as well to actually institute a whole host of various layers of security in our systems. Mm-hmm. Uh, so with, within cryptocurrency space, we have a, a host of, of uh, hot wallets, warm wallets, and cold wallets. And so from your, for your listeners that may or not be familiar with that language, hot wallets are really uh, where your private keys, which are really your keys to the castle, uh, in, in the cryptocurrency space, where if you've got a private key, then you have the right to spend the cryptocurrency at the address associated with that uh, private key. So a hot wallet is where you have those keys online, which are required for liquidity management purposes, because people want their cryptocurrencies as soon as they request them. And so we offer that service. So you request your cryptocurrency and then we you sign it. But also there, it's not just as simple as that. It's also multi-signature. So we have several different keys that have to all come together online to sign a particular transaction for that uh, that those cryptocurrencies to be released from our platform. Then we have uh, warm wallets and warm wallet. And I'll come to warm wallets in a moment. And we also have cold wallets, which is where the the keys are completely offline. So even myself, as a CEO and co-founder of Valor, I individually cannot abscond with any of the funds, even if I wanted to. Okay. And so, um, so there's multi-signature again for 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 the the cold wallets where these keys are actually held in secure institutional grade and military grade uh, kind of security locations that require biometric access. They're video monitored, and there are several of these that need to come together uh, to actually sign a, a cold wallet uh, transaction. So, so, and then the, the warm wallet is effectively just making sure that particular wallets that go in between the cold and the warm are, are uh, basically uh, only able to send cryptocurrency to particular addresses, for example. Uh, and that also limits the, uh, the scope for any breach of security. So these are some of the things that we've done. Now, we actually, uh, if you go onto our website, uh, valr.com, we've also uh, talked a little bit about that and then also our, our support site has more information about how we secure our cryptocurrency assets or our virtual currency assets so that's one of the main things that we do which is uh, and so we've done as, as i hope i've kind of clarified was we've spent a lot of time thinking about that risk and trying to mitigate it now it's important to know that you can never fully fully mitigate that risk 100 percent mm-hmm. and any cryptocurrency exchange or anybody in the cryptocurrency space that tells you so that they've got a 100% secure uh, infrastructure is lying to you. It's just not possible. 
Um, so, so we just need to make sure that that's, that's the case. So we've done a few other things as well, but those are the main things that I've just described. Um, and then I think another major risk is, um, you know, operational risk and also the code, you know, we're, we've got a matching engine that matches our buyers and sellers together. So, so, you know, you want to buy some Bitcoin with your hundred Rand, for example, you might put a bid up, or, uh, you know, a buy order up to, to buy the Bitcoin at a particular price. And so when that gets matched, we need to make sure that the right amounts are debited and credited from each, each account. And if there are any bugs with our code, then we could be double, double crediting people or people who or would be able to kind of withdraw more funds than they have from our platform, etc. So that is just tons and tons of code reviews, testing, audits getting, uh, again, external uh, security firms to come and look at our platform to try to penetrate it to see if there are any issues with it. Uh, so I would say those are, those are two main things that we've had to spend a lot of time on. Uh, and then there's, there's other things like reputational risk, which is just making sure people know what they're buying and uh, they know what a cryptocurrency platform is and they don't press the wrong buttons. And so there's a lot of education that's required. And you'd be surprised there are a lot of customers that that come into this space not knowing very much at all. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, for example, sending Litecoin to a Bitcoin address, okay. you know, um, uh, that's that's something that's happened. And, and we need to work with customers to actually educate them to make sure that they don't make mistakes and they actually understand what they're doing. I mean, this may be going a little bit of topic, but I'm interested by that. If you had to send Litecoin to a Bitcoin address, does it just get lost? Does it come back say you can't send it and you keep your funds, or or yeah, what what actually happens in that situation? So, in this case, effectively the amount was that was sent was very small, and so effectively nothing was done because the risks of recovering that are quite high, and a lot of effort is required to actually go and recover those funds because the private keys, we, we would hold the private keys to that particular address. Mm -hmm. um, but um, uh, you, you'll see like, if you go and look at uh, cryptocurrency exchanges around the world, some of them do offer recovery services, others don't. Um, but wherever they do re uh, offer it, there's a big charge that the exchange needs to charge the customer because as I said, you now need to start uh, effectively exposing private keys where you don't want them to be exposed and trying to mitigate that risk. And so um, it hasn't happened in a big way that we would we have actually had to go and recover those funds, thankfully. Mm -hmm. But if it did, uh, you know, it, it, it is technically possible, the risks are very high and there's obviously a cost to that. Okay. And I mean, this this is maybe like an, an interesting thing about the, the crypto cryptocurrency exchanges is that there is a little bit of that systemic reputation you know when when mount gox went down people kind of thought oh you know can we trust these these cryptocurrency exchanges and i think you know if something similar had to happen nowadays to let's say one of one of the big ones in the us or, or even to say binance or something like that there there might be a systemic shock to to the trust that people have with with their exchanges um, and I mean, the one way to, to potentially get around that is for the existing exchanges to, to say, hey, let's put in regulation. Let's say that you need to get a cryptocurrency license. And the only reason or the only way to get a license is if you have the security in place, if you have the proper systems in place and all these other things. Would that be something that Valor would push for? You know, would you say that's a good idea to have regulation in the cryptocurrency exchanges? Or is that a little bit going against the, the core philosophy of Bitcoin and being a complete decentralized, unregulated uh, instrument? I mean, it's maybe more of a philosophical question, but what are, what are your initial thoughts around that? Yeah, it's a really good question. And I, actually, my view is very clear on it, which is um, uh, I think there's a false dichotomy in the discourse that's being had with the, the cryptocurrency space and the traditional space. And, mm -hmm. and, and, and many people in the cryptocurrency space are saying no regulation and freedom and no government and no law and, you know, each person unto themselves, uh, you know, many, many people are speaking like that. And my view is that's just, uh, that, that, that's just not possible. We, we, you know, law and order is, we've evolved to a society with law and order. 
when we didn't have a society with law and order, we had a lot of violence and we had a lot of kind of, uh, you know, f- whoever had the biggest force or, or whether that was, you know, physical force and intellectual force uh, to, to prevail, uh, would become the ultimate victor at the expense of justice. Mm-hmm. And, um, and so our view is, is very much that for cryptocurrencies to become mainstream and to move from the periphery to the core, we can't pretend that, you know, we're going to be, uh, you know, exempt from, from, uh, you know, regulation and accountability and things of that nature. And so we very much welcome regulation. Okay. Um, provided that the regulation is, is beneficial to society, yes. right? And I think that's why many people have kind of rebelled against regulations because quite honestly, we have a lot of regulation that just shouldn't exist. Mm-hmm. And so we definitely don't want that regulation. But the concept of, of being accountable, the concept of showing the public that you, you actually have, uh, you know, the, the, the necessary skills, resources, know-how, etc., to play in this space, uh, we would welcome that, actually. Okay. So, you know, t- to be clear again, we are a centralized institution but we provide access to decentralized assets like Bitcoin. And so our customers are more than welcome to withdraw their funds to their own wallets that are under their own control. But ultimately, we have customers, we have shareholders, we are integrated into the current banking system, and, uh, and we should certainly be held accountable. And um, we think that we will be moving towards a world where players like us will become more regulated. Mm -hmm. We are working with the regulators right now to say, let's have the correct regulation in place because we don't want a burdensome regulation that becomes so prohibitively expensive that then gets passed on to the end consumer to to negatively affect our industry. So it's a fine fine balance, but as, as a principle, are we for accountability? Absolutely. Would we welcome wise and prudent regulation? Most definitely, but we will also voice uh, or make our voices heard where we feel that there's injustice or where regulations don't make sense. And without going too off topic, we've been very vocal about the fact that uh, exchange control regulation in South Africa doesn't do anybody any any service mm-hmm. and needs to be abolished. Okay, because I mean this this is something that that I just worry about, and I don't know if maybe this is this is the little act tree in me. But um, because it's got a bit of an actuarial nature and it, it comes around the, the reserve management of these exchanges. Because when, yes. I was, when I was trading Bitcoin, you know, I would leave large amounts of both cash and Bitcoin on the exchange uh, just because it was easier to trade than moving everything to a cold wallet and you know, having to wait for everything to you know, move back and forth. But my concern was that if an exchange gets too big, like if they get, you know, too many people are making deposits and there's too much Bitcoin that's just sitting there, there, there almost becomes a, a temptation for the exchange to just shut down and, and keep everyone's money. Now, this might not necessarily be, you know, an exchange here in South Africa. It could be an exchange, you know, overseas or, or elsewhere where they just say, sorry, everyone, we're not going to allow you to withdraw. Um, you know, we're taking the money and, and running away, especially with some of these exchanges where they're not even transparent on who the management team is. And now my, my worry with that is that that might cause, again, another systemic shock that then people all around the world say, oh, we can't trust these these cryptocurrency exchanges. I mean, is, is that something that that you guys are also worried about is the behavior of other exchanges? Or, or do you think that I'm maybe a little bit too too anxious and that it, there won't be that, that systemic uh, shock? No, I think you bring up a very, very good point. Ultimately, uh, exchanges have control over the funds. These are centralized exchanges. Obviously, there's a breed of exchanges called decentralized exchanges mm-hmm. or DEXs where uh, you know, traders have control over their own funds, but they're they're quite clunky at the moment, and the performance is not very good. So, by far, the most volume that's traded uh, is on centralized exchanges. But mm-hmm. um, uh, you know, the scenario you're painting is not a hypothetical one, mm-hmm. right? This scenario has played out uh, before, and uh, you know, 
in various cases, I'm not going to go into all the specifics, but there are particular cases about, you know, founders, uh, you know, claiming to be dead and the funds not being available and, uh, you know, and what seems to be just an absolute uh, scam, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think it's very important for consumers and customers to understand who the exchange is, who's running it, do they trust them? Because ultimately, there, there are lots of different factors to this. So you, 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 talk, you painted the extreme case, which is where an exchange would shut down. Mm-hmm. Let me paint you a more subtle case where you wouldn't even know that something is, uh, is going awry and, um, until potentially it would be too late. So right now, we manage, or all exchanges manage their reserves. Now, we've made it very explicit that we have a 100% reserve policy so if you put Bitcoin onto our platform or RAND onto our platform, we keep those RAND and those Bitcoin 100%, so one-to-one. Mm-hmm. But, you know, just take this scenario, for example. Let's say you didn't trust us or we were dodgy characters, for example, right? Mm-hmm. We could effectively, on our own ledger, create more RANDs or Bitcoin as we please. Yes. And effectively, uh, you know, let's just, just, let's just make it. Uh, practical. Let's just say we had an account and we said, okay, let's just credit this account on our ledger with a, with a million rand. Now, if that million rand doesn't exist in the bank account, then it doesn't really exist. But I can now issue myself with a million rand, say buy X amount of Bitcoin, withdraw the Bitcoin myself. So long as we had enough reserves, nobody would know that that's what we're doing. Yes. Now, obviously, that's completely illegal and completely unethical, and we would never, ever do that. But the point is that I have no doubt that there would have been some exchanges around the world that may have in, involved themselves in such activities. And, um, and actually, some of the ones that have failed uh, have done exactly that. So, so the point being here that it's not, it's not just a binary case of, you know, are you going to shut down and leave or are you going to stay and, and be ethical? There's a very like gray area in between, and so you need to make sure that whatever exchange you are with, uh, first of all, have people that are, have integrity at the helm, and that not only just that, that but they're doing audit. So we, we also have internal checks uh, and balances to make sure that that 100% reserve is there. So, um, so that's the first thing. Now, the second question you asked was really about the, the systemic risk, and if so that happens, what will happen to the price, etc. So. The price may go down, and that's just market risk. You know, there are, there are many reasons why the price would go, right, would go down, but I feel very comfortable with the fact that all our customers have 100% of their money in reserve. And so when they ask for it, then they will get it. Mm-hmm. What the price is, is outside our control as an exchange. Remember, we just bring buyers and sellers together, and the buyers and sellers are the ones that determine the price. So we have no role in setting the price on our exchange. And so people should know that. Uh, if they don't know that, hopefully they do that. They know that now from listening to this. Okay. Um, and so I have no control whether the whether with the price goes up or down. What I do have control over is the integrity of the platform, and that there's a 100% reserve of the funds that people hold with us. So um, so I, I don't worry about that too much because I know that we're doing the right thing, and uh, that our customer funds will be available to them. Um, you know. So, yeah, and I'm talking obviously from a, uh, there's intention, of course, and then there's obviously security risk. We talked about the security risk beforehand, and we're doing everything we can to mitigate any malicious attacks from outside or even within the organization, because a lot of these attacks actually are internal jobs. Yes. Well, I mean, this, this, is, this comes, I guess, to my, my next question, uh, speaking about, you know, these actuarial risks and bearing in mind that, hope, yeah, majority of the audience is, is actuaries. If, if, let's say, Valor was to suddenly get a, a group of actuaries, um, let's say they rocked up at your door and they were now your, your employees, what, what would you get them to do first and why? <laughs> That's a good question. Gosh. Um, I would probably actually start looking at... Uh, improving our detection of of irregular activity on the platform. Okay. 
Um, so obviously, you know, we we accept customers uh, uh, from all over the world, and uh, you know, by far, you know, the vast majority, ninety nine point nine percent of our customers are all legitimate customers, etc. But there's always that very small fraction of people that are trying to do illicit activity. Mm-hmm. Uh, on your platform and we have controls in place but those controls can always get better so i would probably start uh, looking at that uh, looking at our data seeing if there's any ways that we can actually detect that better than than what we're already doing at the moment okay uh, let me ask you what would you use an actuary for i'm, I'm interested to to <laughs> to hear from you now well i guess yeah i mean my my just oh, my, my initial thoughts would be to you know, maybe look at the your revenue streams and see you know how how to maximize or, or optimize those. So, for instance, um, the one is you know the trading of crypto. Uh, with the more volume, you know, the more potential fees that you guys can can earn. Um, what I would do is I would yeah, do some statistical tests to see what is that relationship between uh, volume and fees. And I mean, if it's very sensitive, that means you know reducing fees a little bit increases volume a lot. Then what I might do is maybe recommend um, a strategy that Vanguard did with passive investing, where what they said is, uh, you know, traditionally asset managers were charging two percent and all of these things, you know, to cover their their costs and stuff. Vanguard said. We're going to start with 1% and when we get a certain amount of volume, we're going to reduce down to 0.7% and then 0.5%. So the more volume they got, they lowered their fees because they could then maintain a certain amount of of profit. Um, And what that then did is it just meant more and more money started pouring into into the Vanguard fund to a state where I think if I I remember correctly, they were getting or they still are getting a billion dollars every day coming into into the Vanguard funds because of this philosophy of by reducing our fees, um, we're going to get more volume and the amount from that volume. So even if we reduce the fees by one point, we could actually end up making money because of that, that increase in volume. Of course, you can only do that if the statistical test shows that there is that sensitive yeah. relationship. Uh, you know, if, if people aren't that sensitive to fees and you reduce fees, it, you know, you might be shooting yourself uh, in the foot. So I mean that, that's that's one thing I would I would look at, and then the other thing I would look at is I would maybe look at what other potential um, again revenue streams you guys could 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 tap into, and the one thing that um, and I guess this is maybe copying from from Binance is what they do is they've almost turned into a bit of like a consultancy firm as well, um, in the sense that these crypto exchanges are gateways to to the decentralized uh, you know to the decentralized world. And Vela could position itself as as a potential partner to a lot of other projects, saying, you know what, we can get your stable coin um, to the market, or we can list your non fungible tokens here, um, or you know, we can assist with with some of these things. Um, of course, that comes that might be a completely different business model, or or something that re- you know requires a whole different set of of skills. Um, and then I guess thirdly, thirdly, my, my final thing that I might get my actuaries to do is I would get my actuaries to maybe you know, create a case for why institutions should, should invest in, in Bitcoin. Um, bearing in mind that a lot of actuaries are the expert advisors to pension funds and pension funds are you know, some of the biggest players in the market. So if you can get your actuaries to create a bit of a pitch deck explaining to the actuaries that are uh, helping the pension funds to one, buy Bitcoin, and two, buy through your exchange because you've got the security, you know, you've got all this risk management in place. Um, you might then see your volume, uh, yeah, exponentially grow. So it's 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 interesting. I'm I'm what yeah, I like to think of myself as the optimistic actuary, you know, focusing on how do we increase revenue. Uh, whereas I think yeah, some of the other actuaries might yeah. come in from a pessimist view and say, how do we reduce expenses? Um, but yeah. yeah. Those are, I don't know. What 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 are your thoughts on those ideas? Do you think they they good? Do you think they no, bad? I like them. <laughs> I, I like them. You know, um, uh, we've actually done. We especially when I was at the first round group at Rand Merchant Bank, mm-hmm. we actually spent a lot of time on on some of those things, and we were actually trying to sell the case internally mm-hmm. to to launch a, a Bitcoin uh, exchange uh, to start off with, and uh, we actually did those models. Mm-hmm. And uh, they were very, very attractive. 
but um, you know the, the challenge is that there's so much more than just uh, you know the revenue model over here that's that's involved it's becoming better but there were so many misconceptions about what cryptocurrency was what Bitcoin was what it stood for whether it was legal or not what the regulatory framework was etc so I think uh, in time we should certainly do all of those things that you've just talked about um, I suppose it's just the timing that's going to be important to see when that is. Mm -hmm. No, look, and I mean, coming, coming, like I, you know, I touched on that about you know maybe consulting with a stablecoin person, you know, uh, launching on mm. your fund. But has has Vela ever thought of making its own coin? You know, where one rand equals one Vela um, idea. Like, ha have you played with that idea, or what? What is your opinion of stablecoins? You're 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 probing very deeply now. <laughs> <laughs> so so no, that's that's uh, it's a good question, and then the answer is definitely yes. Um, so I think stable coins have their role, um, but uh, sometimes if they haven't been thought up thought about too deeply, then they remain not very useful. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think for us, for example, a stable coin. Uh, would be very helpful if it would assist with the transfer of value of rands between exchanges and uh, not only in South Africa but internationally as well mm -hmm. um, uh, to facilitate, you know, say arbitrage trading, for example, or just just more convenience, you know, because oftentimes the banking system just takes too long with the transfer of rands. Yes. So we've certainly thought about that. It's definitely. Uh, let me put it this way, it's definitely on our radar. Okay. Because, I mean, this, this is the thing. I, I like stable coins and I like thinking about, you know, the, their design. You know, do you keep them purely stable or do you put in a little bit of, you know, they grow with inflation, all these things. But one right. stable coin yeah. that I just, I don't know, I just have a bad feeling about them is, is Tether. So I, I'm, not, I'm just curious to hear, what is, what is your opinion of, of Tether? I mean, they're in the news quite a lot, you know, with, with the New York uh, attorney generals for doing, you know, all their, their weird and wonderful things. Um, what, what are your thoughts of Tether? Does it make you nervous or do you think people are making a fuss about nothing um, regarding, regarding their coin? Yeah, I think it's very difficult to tell, you know. I think Tether is one of the oldest stable coins that, that's been out there and um, has facilitated a lot of the dollar trading uh, through their through their, uh, you know, USDT coin. Um, the thing is this, though, there were, I think there is reason, there's a reason why a lot of people have been skeptical is because, you know, for a long time, um, it, it's not that difficult to put out an audit report to say, listen, this is how much Tether is in existence and this is how much we have in our reserves. And that was proving to be a difficult thing to come by. Mm -hmm. And so when people say, well, listen, it's, it's not that difficult to do. Why aren't you doing it? Uh, are you, do you really have them fully in reserve or not? And then there was, you know, news that a, a large amount of that money was actually held by other institutions, etc. So, so am I worried about it? I think, uh, you know, uh, I, I don't have enough information as to say, you know, what the reality of the situation is, even right now with all the public information that has come out. Mm -hmm. um, I would suggest that if anybody is actually dealing with them and with, with or has Tether, that you, you, you make sure you understand the risks because um, effectively the value of Tether is really tied to the fact that it is backed by RAND, some, uh, by, sorry, by, by dollars in, in, a, in a bank account somewhere. Mm -hmm. And that's back to back to one to one. Now, you know, even the terms and conditions of Tether have changed dramatically on their websites since uh, over the last few years about it being redeemable, it being backed one to one, it being backed by a basket of assets, etc. So it's changed over time, and so it's unclear to me. I actually don't even know what the latest is right now. But um, I, 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 are there risks with it? Absolutely. Um, am I worried that it would disentangle, so to speak? Uh, is the chance of that non-zero? Definitely it's non-zero. Mm -hmm. And if it does happen, would it affect the cryptocurrency markets? Absolutely, I think it would, because 
I actually think if, uh, from, from some stats I looked at recently, the tether pairing has the highest um, uh, volume traded, even higher than a Bitcoin pairing. Yes. So, uh, so it's really actually, it's, it plays a very big role in the current cryptocurrency system. But uh, is it the Achilles heel? No. You know, will cryptocurrency survive without it? Absolutely. Okay. Will there be some some short term turmoil if something happens? Definitely, but uh, I'm I'm not too concerned uh, about it in the long run. And then I mean maybe yeah I guess they they might be similar to Tether in the sense that they might also have a bit of like a stable stable coin mindset. But what is your your feeling about Facebook's coin? And do you think there's going to be a lot more of these corporate coins? Like I see Walmart also thinking about it. I mean, it, for me, it makes sense if Google made it, you know, especially since I make revenue on YouTube and I spend sometimes money on Google ads, you know, it would make sense to just use a, a coin to, to facilitate those, those actions. But yeah, what, what are your thoughts about corporate coins and, and this Facebook thing that's going to be coming out uh, yeah, soon? Because we need a whole, a whole, a whole other episode for that. But let me try to, <laughs> try to see if I can, I can make it concise. So I think it's a fascinating concept, first of all. Mm-hmm. Um, it's unclear to me why Facebook is using a cryptocurrency, mm-hmm. apart from uh, its clear marketing appeal to the public. You know, cryptocurrency is sexy at the moment. And if you come out with your own cryptocurrency, it's, it's something to think about rather than, oh, We've come out with our own, you know, uh, reward point, which sounds very, very different, mm-hmm. um, or, or you know, our own internal currency that you can use on our platform. But you know, Facebook uh, across their platforms has billions of users, a huge proportion of humanity. Yeah. And so, if they had a coin that was backed, as they say, Libra is. You know, it's a stable coin, which is backed by a basket of currencies as Libra is currently planned to be. Um, There is no reason that they couldn't just issue it on their platform without being a cryptocurrency. Yeah. You know, they they talk about kind of, uh, you know, know, having the association behind them, which was initially a group of, I think, 27 different institutions that were effectively going to be the custodians of, of this private blockchain. But effectively, when you have a private blockchain, or what's called a permissioned blockchain, mm-hmm. that implies the existence of a permissioner, and that permissioner is generally centralized. Yeah, And so it begs the question of why you're having this on a blockchain in the first place. It's a bit of an oxymoron. So, a private blockchain. Exactly, exactly. Now, now, now Facebook has said it's going to be you know migrated to a public blockchain, but there's no clarity on what that would even look like, which blockchain it would be on, et cetera, et cetera. So, so I think the thing is right now, very few people actually in the world understand the intricacies between all of these different, you know, private blockchain and public blockchain, what the implications are, and uh, you know, what's possible with and without them, what a migration plan would look like, et cetera. Okay. And so, so that's the first thing. The second thing is that Facebook is a centralized entity. Mm-hmm. As you would have seen from the press, Countries like France are already saying that this is not going to fly and we're not going to allow it in our borders. Mm-hmm. Now, obviously, this is a threat in many ways to sovereign currency because if you're a Facebook user and you want to send it, say, on Facebook or WhatsApp or Instagram or whatever it may be, then conceivably you could actually just do it to any other user in the world and it should be instantaneous. Yeah. Uh, the current financial system doesn't work like that and it's you know it's actually in a pretty appalling state if you if you look at our, our global financial system. And so there's a lot of threats to the status quo, which is why the US Congress and many others have said, wait a minute, Facebook, you can't proceed until we're happy with it. Mm-hmm. And why Facebook is trying to do a lot of things to appease the public and the, and the regulators particularly. Well, it, it, so, it, it, well it, it just reminds me coming, coming to with the government's being worried about it. There's that quote, I don't know if he said it or they, you know, just they attributed to him later, but apparently Nathaniel Rothschild uh, famously said, that whoever controls the issuance of, of money um, controls the country. And yeah, I think this is why some governments are worried about Facebook, because if Facebook's exactly. the one in control of the, the money, then government's sovereignty is, is challenged a, a bit. So it's a, 
it, it's an interesting political question as well as I guess financial question that one as well. Uh, absolutely, and actually Facebook, you know, when when posed with the, that that thinking, Facebook says, well, we're not issuing the currency because it's backed by your currency in the reserves, mm-hmm. right? So, but then the question is, well, who can see the transactions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And in such a case, if if such a if Libra were to take off. Then conceivably you'd have these big reserves sitting in bank accounts and no movement of them, and all the movement would be happening on Facebook's ledgers, actually understanding sp- uh, people's spending habits uh, yeah. and and quite private information, which is also where some of the concerns come in. So I think the last point to say about this is that, given the fact that Facebook is a centralized entity, there's a Mark Zuckerberg behind it, there's a board behind it, etc. Mm-hmm. That actually they probably won't be able to, to 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 launch it without the blessings of the regulators. Yeah. And if they do things that are against the law, then guess what? They go to jail. Mm-hmm. Now that's very different to Bitcoin, right? You can't put the head of Bitcoin in jail because there is no head of Bitcoin. You can't put, uh, you, you know, you can't kill the 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 servers of Bitcoin because it's a decentralized uh, network. Yes. And so I have a lot of doubts as to whether. Libra will ever even get off the ground at all, mm-hmm. let alone how it will be adopted. So obviously I could be wrong and, and who knows, but uh, I think probably if I had to put a bet against it, I would say odds are against it getting off the ground, but not, not to say that it's impossible. Well, I mean, this, this is the one thing I do like about Bitcoin is the fact that we don't know who Satoshi is, you know, we don't know um, who's the main influencer of it. Um, it's the one problem I, I guess I have with Litecoin is that even though Charlie Lee is trying to distance himself and work from afar, he still is tied very closely to the coin. And it's one thing Bitcoin, I think no other coin, I don't know, maybe maybe I'm, I'm taking a, I'm being you know too presumptuous here, but I don't think in the future we're going to get another situation where a cryptocurrency like Bitcoin comes along that is doesn't have you know a champion saying, hey, this is what I made, this is why we should use it. I think Bitcoin has got that unique competitive advantage that the that the other coins don't have. But I think I, I'm I'm looking at the time, and I know we we've gone over the the hour. So I want to maybe end with with one last question, um, and that I guess comes down to to Bitcoin and and Vela. And the question is as follows: Is that some people that I've spoken to they feel that Bitcoin is nothing more than a bit of space on a decentralized ledger. And that when the holders of the coin figure this out, they're going to lose interest and that they're just going to sell. Um, so my, my question is, is there a concern that the hype for Bitcoin might drop? And should exchanges like Vela actively try to generate hype or, or keep the momentum going so that you can continue to see the volumes and collect their trading fees? Um, what are your thoughts on yeah, the, that statement about Bitcoin and the role that exchanges should, should play in it? So I would say to an individual that says that Bitcoin is just uh, some taking up some digital space on a decentralized ledger, uh, wait until you find out or wait until the world finds out. I would say, well, uh, hey, buddy, uh, I don't know if you know, but uh, your current money that you call it is currently uh, some digital space that's taking, or some digital, you know, ones and zeros that's taking some space on a centralized ledger mm-hmm. that isn't backed by anything. So wait until the world finds out about that. Mm-hmm. So, so, um, so really, I think there is such a misconception of what money is. Yes. Uh, and people don't realize that actually money is more of a social concept. Yes, and it's more of a societal and a psychological concept than it is a financial one or or even a monetary one, to be honest. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, monetary obviously it is monetary, but but the reason I say that is that money has changed throughout history. Mm-hmm. Its form has changed, you know, and it has always moved towards what is the most frictionless form of money. Mm-hmm. So, in my mind, there is no doubt that cryptocurrency are the next generation of the form of money that society will be dealing with. Now, whether it's Bitcoin or Ethereum or Libra for that matter, or whatever else it may be, I can't tell you. Um, but if, if, if you think that Bitcoin is going to crash because it's 
some space on a decentralized ledger, then I think somebody should probably do some more research about the current financial system. Okay. So that's the first. Well, then, the then, second point is. Well, then maybe yeah. let me let me change the second part of my question then. From instead of okay. uh, generating hype, should the exchanges therefore be involved in actively educating the the population about money? Is that like a responsibility yeah. that you should be doing? So, so I I. I I don't know if it's like a, like it's an ethical responsibility that you have to educate people about money as an exchange because sometimes people just want an exchange to do its job, which is to exchange, mm -hmm. you know, one asset for another. But we at Valor certainly feel that we want to educate the public and actually not just about the new world but about the old world and the old financial system that we're still in, by the way. Mm -hmm. So, um, so, and just to, to to actually address your your previous question, I definitely don't think exchanges should involve themselves in any way in hyping up coins. Okay. I, I actually think that's unethical because uh, then people that don't really know where to look hear about this coin that's going up in price or whatever it may be, then they go and buy and then any any hype that's not based on any solid foundation is going to pop. Yes. And then you get innocent bystanders, or not bystanders, but innocent people that are actually, were bystanders, but are actually coming to partake in the activity who get burned the most. So I think we have a huge responsibility to, to, to be, uh, to uphold the highest levels of integrity because it's such a new space and there's so little knowledge about it. So do we want to educate? Absolutely. Do we want to hype things up? Uh, no, uh, we, we just want to take things in stride, make sure people understand this new technology. Are there risks to it? Absolutely. But we feel very confident that this is the next kind of uh, financial paradigm to which the whole world is moving. Okay, perfect. No, look, thank you, thank you so much. And and like I say, I mean, I could I could chat for for absolute ages about this. And what you've been saying has really been stimulating. So I just want to say thank you so much, yeah, for taking the time, uh, for yeah, being part of this, being part of this podcast.